The role of women in church leadership has often been a controversial topic. Historically, women have been frustrated by the rhetoric that claims to be supportive, but leaving them feeling marginalized and impaired in the roles that they feel called to. So how do we reconcile this dissonance between the reality of hierarchy in so many denominations and the call of God upon capable women? Here to discuss her book, God Forgive Us for Being Women, author and speaker Joy Qualls is an associate professor and department chair of communication studies at Biola University. Stick around for this important conversation. We'll be right back. Welcome back, friends. You are in for such a treat today. We're going to talk with my friend Joy Qualls. And Joy, I just so appreciate that you've taken the time out of your incredibly <laughs> busy schedule to be here with us in the studio. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, Brenda. Thank you so much. Well, you know that I adore you. And uh, in many ways, uh, I, I questioned myself when I said, I really want to have this interview. <laughs> but please don't throw too much at me that I can't manage, but uh, you know, I'm a student and uh, I really appreciate your work you. and uh, your knowledge. I think you have a lot to teach us right now, specifically in the area of ministry in the church and where we're going with you know, the roles of women in leadership. Yeah, right. And your book specifically is um, God Forgive Us for Being Women, <laughs> Rhetoric, Theology, and the Pentecostal Tradition. So in it, you really are addressing um, specifically some of the, the Pentecostal tradition in the Assembly of God Church, yes. which is where you come from. That's correct. That's my tradition yeah. is in the Assemblies of God. So I am by trade a rhetorician, which is just a yeah. fancy academic word. <laughs> and uh, you're going to have to explain that yes. to us. So the word rhetoric gets tossed around in our culture rather inappropriately in terms of definition. We tend to think of it as being sort of empty or bombastic mm -hmm. or, or perhaps even lies being yeah. presented to us. But right. historically, the term rhetoric um, refers more to the human use of symbols mm -hmm. to induce a response in other human beings. So mm -hmm. when we think about rhetoric, what we think about is the process of communication. Okay. It is persuasive in its intent. Yes. Uh, but even when we share information, what we're looking for is people to assent to what mm -hmm. we believe or to oh, accept us okay. and what we are saying. And so mm -hmm. persuasion is not always about changing minds, hearts, or behavior, although that would be wonderful. But yeah. the idea of rhetorical action is that we bring people along and they want to continue to stay along with us. And so wow. persuasion is a process. Okay. So because I've always thought of rhetoric as more empty words. Right. And it can be. It can be. Right? It can be. But the, the idea is, is that we uh, are using tools mm -hmm. of persuasion to try to encourage others to want to hear from us more. And, yeah. and so when I look at, the, uh, at rhetorical analysis, mm -hmm. what I'm looking for, how have organizations, groups, individuals used language to try to persuade or dissuade oh, okay. uh, people to one position or another. Right. So when you talk about, you know, some of the uh, traditions in the Pentecostal church yeah. uh, movement, you really have pointed out that they've, there's, there's been no boundaries given to women in terms of leadership roles, and yet they haven't really practiced what they've preached, and that's incited a little bit of frustration. That's right. So that, that's what I'm looking at in this particular text is the, dis, is the disconnect mm -hmm. between policy and practice. Yeah. So historically in the Pentecostal tradition, which we attribute to beginning in here in Los Angeles yeah. and uh, uh, at the turn of the last century, and the, the notion was on whomever the spirit fell, leadership was a gift that was that was given to them. Right. It was empowerment for service mm -hmm. uh, was the, was the concept and idea. And so it wasn't it wasn't about gender. It wasn't about race. Right. It wasn't about socioeconomic class. Really, um, Galatians uh, three twenty eight uh, uh, is where people get that idea mm -hmm. from. Right in mm -hmm. Christ, we are no longer yes. male nor female. So Correct. the gender lines are broken. We're no longer slave nor free. Yeah. The socioeconomic lines are broken. We're no longer Jew nor Greek. The, right. the, the racial lines are broken. And yet we keep these mindsets that divide us. That's right. So That's what was so beautiful, really, about Azusa Street. 
That's right. So that that was mm -hmm. what made it so revolutionary. It wasn't just another religious revival. It was a social and cultural revival mm -hmm. that changed the way we perceived the work of God in the world. Yeah. So to quote, I think this came from your introduction. Uh, more specifically, your emphasis is on what you call the rhetorical under pinnings of the discrepancies that have existed and continue to permeate the role of women in American religion and church leadership. Yeah, so, so what I'm looking at is the ways in which uh, that empowerment that yeah. we saw at the height of the revival, okay. um, how it gets institutionalized. So okay. as uh, churches formed, as denominations formed, a lot of those freedoms that we saw in revival mm -hmm. start to get hemmed in by boundaries. Mm -hmm. Then there's the relationship between Pentecostalism and the broader um, Protestant church, the evangelical church. And, right. and at one point we stopped wanting to be the kids on the other side of the tracks, you know, yeah. the, the poor kids and, and the less educated. And we wanted to be accepted by the broader uh, church and in doing so we perhaps diminished some of those things that made us distinctive wow. and in order to be accepted by that broader evangelical community and and now Pentecostals make up the largest membership in the National Association of Evangelicals but I would argue that perhaps uh, evangelical influence has diminished more about Pentecostalism than Pentecostalism has influenced that evangelicalism. Something? Kind of an ir ironic thing. It is. Yeah, it it, it is wasn't always much. that way. No. Well, you, um, there was, you're not really approaching this from like a feminist no, in type fact, of. Yeah, yeah, intentionally stay away from feminism. Right. Because. So explain uh, that for our viewers, because I think that this is a real trigger point for sure. a lot of people sure. in the evangelical world. Right. Um, they feel like, oh, don't, don't be, you know, keep women in their place, keep men in there. There's a lot of complementarianism. Complementarianism. Yes. That's what I grew up with. Right, right. And uh, so coming out of that and really f more fully understanding this, um, I, I think has been a real work of God in my life. So unpack that a little bit for us. So I, I think if, if you, again, think about feminism as a social movement, mm -hmm. uh, that's where we start to, to, yeah. to break paths. Right. But if we think about the notion of women being created in the image of God with full value yes. and full worth in the same way that men are created, mm -hmm. that term um, becomes a little less caustic. But yeah. I, I purposefully stay away from that term because I, I think part of it is we have to know our audience, we have to know who we're speaking to. And I knew if I used the notion of feminist criticism or, or critical criticism in that yeah. way, I, I wouldn't be heard. And so I wanted to approach it wow. from a different perspective to say, what is in our theology that gives, again, men and women the freedom with which they operate, and, and how does that help us understand the purpose that God has called each one of us to? So I'm not looking at, um, uh, isms of who gets to lead and who doesn't get to lead, yeah. but rather uh, are we allowing the work of the Holy Spirit oh, to flow so freely through yeah. people uh, in, a, in a natural way? And whatever leadership they ascend to is, is because of that call of God on their mm -hmm. life, not because of man-made uh, restrictions and stipulations. Exactly, the, where the anointing rests, who it rests upon, it should be flowing through. And there's often gatekeepers. And, and don't you think that there's a little bit of a, you know, the threat might come through fear because of the pursuit of power in our culture? I mean, is that kind of what's behind a lot of this? Absolutely. Uh, you know, I mean, I wish we could say that as people who believe in Jesus, yeah. that, that we don't care mm -hmm. about the fame and the yeah. influence that comes with position. And when that's threatened, mm -hmm. whether it's by a new movement, whether mm -hmm. it's by a challenge to, to old uh, religious structures, or whether it's by yeah. male and female relationships, it, it's a challenge to those power mm -hmm. structures. And Whenever we do that, mm -hmm. uh, that humanity inside of us, that, that sin nature rises up and says, no, I have to be in power. But really what it is is fear, right? Yes. It's a fear of a loss of our own identity mm -hmm. as opposed That's to, um, you know, whether or not only this person or this type mm -hmm. of person is, is gifted with the yeah. ability to, to spread the gospel. Yeah, we're more comfortable with these 
cookie cutter molds that we can control. That's right. Uh, because we're afraid of losing power. And I mean, this is affecting everything from racial issues to uh, gender, some of the gender roles. And uh, it doesn't belong in the church. And going back again to Azusa Street, I mean, that was the beauty of what happened in Azusa. And it also is what caused a lot of the turmoil and some of the fallout eventually uh, because of those that wanted power, wanted control, but what they what they were experiencing there was every economic level, uh, socioeconomic level, mm -hmm. and race, gender, it didn't matter. They were ministering to one another. Even the children That's were right. ministering yes. prophetically yes. to some of the, the generals, yes. you know, the That's great right. men of God that yeah. were there. That's right. And now, what do you think the secret is? I mean, we've got a couple minutes left in this first sure. segment, but what's the secret to us returning I mean, I would think that it, a lot of it is going to be through voices like yours that know how to communicate. <laughs> uh, you know, you're the department chair of communications at Biola University, and you certainly are an expert in understanding um, how to communicate the thought and in a non-threatening way. But what is it going to take for us to make this shift and to get to where we really need to go? So I think it comes back to how we talk about things. So yeah. one of my mantras, if you will, is how we talk about things matters. Mm -hmm. So the way we talk about leaders matters. Uh, when we talk about leadership, we start to differentiate between who can be a leader and who can't be. But when we talk about servants, we never talk about who can be a servant and who can't be, wow. right? Everybody can be that. So if, so if leadership is about service, then those restrictions mm -hmm. move away. Mm -hmm. uh, so the language that we use, the choices of language that mm -hmm. we use, the way we think about who leaders are. And so I, I know there's a lot of controversy in our culture today about uh, the use of things like pronouns. But the reality is, is when we use words like she to refer to pastors and, and right. leaders in the church, it, it causes people to think differently about who can be in that place. So yeah. the images we put up, the, mm. the way in which we talk about leadership, the way in which we talk about God, who is yeah. both masculine and feminine in his attributes. If we're created in his image and we look at the way God describes himself in the scripture, mm. it, it embodies and encompasses all of those things. Yes. We, don't, we don't have to be afraid of that. Mm -hmm. um, yes, the world has corrupted many of those concepts, but our God has overcome the world. And yeah. so we don't have to be afraid of, of thinking about, well, if I call a, a church leader, she, or I, I put mm -hmm. an image of a woman up, right. am I... Her t am I kowtowing to the world right. <laughs> instead to say, no, this is yeah. actually a reflection of the image of God in, in the body of Christ. Yeah, but there's a little bit of uh, an intimidating spirit that we have to deal with when we're walking in, when we want to walk in that spirit and truth. And there's a tension there. So I, we're going to go away and take a, a short little break. But when we come back, I want you to address that. Sure. Okay, don't go away. We'll be right back. Paul and Brenda Crouch here. Baby, we have great plans coming yeah, we up. We do. We're here in Anaheim at our beautiful studio that God has provided. What do we have coming up? We just finished season four, and we have plans to do some broadcasting from around the world, mm -hmm. uh, different locations, and God's opening doors for us. Amen. But they say you have not mm -hmm. because you ask not. Mm -hmm. And in four years, we have never asked for a donation or any yeah. kind of support and now we are. We have stuff that are that Brenda said is in the works, in the plans, partnering together with you to make it happen. How do we make that? Amen. What do, we, what do you think? Well, you know what, I, I just want you to know, we all know that there have been abuses out there and uh, it's our heart to see that media is done right and that we give God glory for everything. And we just are following the call and we're doing it honest. And uh, we hope that you will catch the vision and ride this wave with us and know Amen. that it, God is gonna continue to pour more and more out as we follow in obedience to him. Amen. Go to Brenda's website. There's all kinds of resources there for giving. God bless you. BrendaCrouch.com. Welcome back. We're talking with my friend Joy Qualls and about women in leadership roles in the church. But right before we took our break, uh, we were mentioning the fact that there's a lot of intimidation or intimidating voices that come against women and really, mm -hmm. I think, uh, are tailored to shut our mouths. Right, right. And 
I know I've come up against that. I'm sure you have come mm -hmm. up against that yeah, many times. many times. And so, you know, my question is, I know we can't really control anything, uh, and there's, there's an element here that is uh, very practical. There's an element that is very mm -hmm. spiritual. Right. Are there strongholds at work that are actually trying to limit the work of the church and marginalize us and keep us in a bound place. What's happening? Yeah, so I think the enemy has been after women from the very beginning, yeah. right? He didn't, yeah. he didn't target the male mm -hmm. in the garden. Mm -hmm. He targeted the female. And, and we often like to make that because somehow she was the weaker right. vessel and right. things of that nature. But I, I, I think because God's plan was in place even before the garden was created, the reality is the Savior was going to come through the woman. Yeah. And, and wow. the enemy knew that, and that's her. why he targeted her. And as a result of that, the enemy has been after women because, because there are people who don't believe the Savior has mm -hmm. come. So even though I believe that Savior's come and crushed the head of, of the serpent, if he continues to go after women, yes. uh, then his ability to diminish those who will come to believe in that Savior uh, might also be diminished. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so I, I think we're a natural target for, and I don't want to say everybody's being used by the devil. That, you know, right, I think... Right. Uh, that perhaps is a little too woo woo sure. for, for where I would I would go, but to but to but the but the notion is is that even women can be women's own worst enemies. Oh yeah. Because what we again are afraid of mm. is the idea that if a woman comes into the fullness of her calling, mm -hmm. into the fullness of of the the things of Jesus, mm -hmm. the power of that is so great. And again, it's it's not diminishing the power of men. It's yeah. it's it's men and women together, side mm -hmm. by side, are the full image of God. Yeah. But but when men, when women come into that power, the enemy is threatened in ways mm -hmm. that are unique to her being, yeah. or unique to her creation. And, and so I think you're seeing it. I think you're seeing it in our culture. You're seeing it in our church. Right. Um, you're seeing it in uh, the the broader world that we live in, right? Who who when an attack comes, uh, do the vigilantes go after? Right? They go right. after women, and it's and it's and it's rape and it's violence against yeah. women that are are these weapons of war. Mm -hmm. And so whether it's rhetorical through our words and yeah. and, and through the way we um, develop Symbols. and and define gates that mm -hmm. keep people in and out, or whether it's actual. Uh, physical violence. Mm -hmm. um, this has been the tool of the enemy from the very beginning, yeah. and and so I think women who rise up and find their voice yes. in Christ Jesus and in the work of the Holy Spirit. And I think that's the key: is rise up and find your voice. What does that mean? Because right. in the by the world's terms, a lot of that is still still fear driven. Right. And so then it's it's not working. That is rebellion. That is uh, caustic. And I think that's what many people are misinterpreting a movement like a truth, like what you're bringing to the right. table here right. as being. And, and when women are resting in the identity that God has given to them and rising up in the authority that he's given them of truth and spirit, uh, spirit and truth, there's something there that they should not be threatened by, that we should be one in that. There, there's a reciprocal work that should take place but there I, I think that the um what concerns me for women is that we're seeing a lot of platform because women don't know who they are right. i mean i come from a background where my voice was nearly taken from me and i bought the counterfeit for many years joy right. and what god has done is to unravel me and then he's rebuilding me in his image right. and that's just so powerful to me and my prayer is to walk in that spirit and truth always and to not be afraid of the truth, not right. to be afraid to speak the truth, but how we craft that message I think is important. So a lot of women are wanting platform to feel significant uh, and we live in an age of technology that allows that, it really fosters that, but we're in an age of narcissism. Mm -hmm. So would mm -hmm. you please address the difference and how important it is to... Um, know how to communicate the real message of Christ and the gospel. So I, I think we live in an age of the influencer, right? Mm -hmm. Whatever, can, we can get into 30-second sound bites that we can throw right. onto a two-minute right. Instagram video that will make us famous. Mm -hmm. and, and the idea of the celebrity leader 
is not unique to women, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but I, again, I think we have to check ourselves constantly mm -hmm. about what our motivation is. Mm -hmm. um, God may give us large platforms, right. but he might also give us the living room in our own home. Yeah. And, and so I'm not opposed to platforms. What I'm opposed yeah. to is a motivation mm -hmm. that is about fame mm -hmm. and power mm -hmm. seeking uh, that uses the message of the gospel Correct. as a way to manipulate yeah. and to That's coerce it. people. Uh, but and we've seen too much of that. Oh, far too much. And, and women are just as susceptible mm -hmm. to that as, as men are. But I, I think we need um, good mentors in our lives. I think yeah. we need um, women alongside us. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we need people that we're mentoring. Yeah. And I think if you have, I, I called it recently a personal board, right? A personal board right. of directors, <laughs> right? So if you have uh, a sage and a mentor yes. above you who are speaking mm. um, both wisdom, truth, and correction mm -hmm. into your life, if you have friends and peers beside you who will mm -hmm hold you accountable and keep yeah. you um, grounded. And if you have people who you are raising up, if you're being a spiritual mother, mm -hmm. as opposed to a celebrity leader, right. you are influencing yeah. the next generation in a, in a better mm -hmm. way. And, yeah. I, and I think it keeps us from some of those temptations. Yeah. Uh, truly. The, the allure is there. Oh, it is. You know, the allure oh. is Because is there's there. a sense of power that comes with that. And that's you know, it's what, which power are we seeking? Which cup right. of power are we drinking from? That's right. And, uh, you know, when people can't, I'm no expert on communication, but I do know this. When people cannot step out, out of the way and get outside of themselves, if, if the focus is on me fixing my own insecurities, it doesn't matter where I am. I'm going to permeate the room with that problem. That's right. And I'm not serving. I'm That's not right. helping people, even though I might be posing as, the, as right. that I am. Right. And uh, people don't respond well to that. So how do we uh, become better communicators of the gospel? Those, those women that have been waiting for, you know, that are following the call, they're, they're, they've been shut down so many times mm -hmm. by the gatekeepers. Right. Right. How do we um, responsibly, I know that you have, um, uh, what, is, what is the five elements of communication I think I've heard you talk on, yes. and I'd like for you to go there with us for a minute sure. and just give some Christian uh, leaders some, some good sound advice for preparing our messages, understanding how to reach the audience that, that whether that's a one-on-one -on -one or a large arena yeah. that God has yeah. placed us in. Every communication situation, mm -hmm. whether it's you and I sitting here having a and conversation. I'm now. No, 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 <laughs> not at all. But whether it's you and I having a conversation or it is somebody yeah. standing on a stage delivering a sermon or right. it's a professor giving a lecture, every communication situation mm -hmm. has five elements. Yeah. A speaker, an audience, mm. and by the way, we're both speaker and audience at the same yeah. time, right? I'm, I'm sending the message, you're receiving the message, yes. but you're also sending the message, and yeah. I'm receiving the message. There's a message, Good. there's a channel. Um, we're here taping a, a program today, so it'll be broadcast on a channel, yeah. um, and there's an occasion. What called this mm. forth? And so what, what brought us here today? And so I actually think occasion is one of the most important elements yeah. of the communication process because if you can identify mm. a reason to engage with somebody on the message that God has given you, so good. then God will use that. So it doesn't mm -hmm. have to be on a stage behind a pulpit. Now, right. I will advocate for that every day of the week yeah. if that's what it is that God has mm -hmm. called a, a woman or a man to do. Mm -hmm. But it might start with one-on-one -on -one conversations over mm -hmm. coffee. Mm -hmm. It might start with discipling your own children in your home. Those are all important communication situations. And if we understand the, the, the power of communication in the faithful environments, yeah. we will also be able to see the power of those communication situations in mm. the constructed environments. Oh, yeah. I, I think that's very wise advice. And uh, we're, what would you say to uh, women that know that they're equipped, they know that God has called them, and yet they're being shut down. I mean, there are so many denominations now. This is a very controversial thing in our present day right. church culture. Uh, so 
is God using women outside of the box? Is, is that where he has to take us? Uh, encourage us as to how we can still be useful um, in the lives of those that we feel our message pertains to. You know, I think people believe that there's one way to do all of this. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not pastoring a church, if I'm not leading a large ministry, I'm not um, using the voice that God mm -hmm. gave me. And so I would even say to my sisters in those spaces where there are those limitations, that they would think about operating in their gifts in the spaces that they do have access yeah, to. And, and if you start in those spaces and are faithful in those spaces, mm -hmm. God will multiply those things. Mm -hmm. I, I was he recently does. listening to a podcast with a, with a woman from a theological position that she and I would probably not see eye to eye on, but she's uh, had doors open to her that perhaps others have not had open because she's faithfully worked within mm -hmm. the system that God has given her mm -hmm. to. And, and again, it, it's not a system I would want to work within, right. but at the same time, I, I have great respect and admiration for her because she's figured out who her message is for mm -hmm. and she's operating in the channels that God has given her to operate. And so I, I cheer her on instead of saying, well, she should be able to do this too. <laughs> yeah, right. You know, no, her her influence, mm. the space that, that God has given her is is likely greater yeah, uh, than it would be if she was trying to beat down the doors to 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 be on every platform mm. that, that she could be on. And and so I, I encourage her obedience. I yeah. think that's that's the biggest thing. I mean, I wanna be rhetorical and persuasive about what I believe is the is the theologically sound position, mm -hmm. but I don't want to tear down my right. sisters and brothers who are creating space, right. even within those spaces that are more limiting. And we're in a culture inside of the church right now where, and it's polarizing because we're accepting a lot of that and there's no honor. We've, we've kind of lost our way. Yeah. Yeah, so, listen, we invented cancel culture. Oh my goodness. You know, we we, did. we were the first to boycott. We were the first mm -hmm. to say, if you differ from us in this, you can no longer mm -hmm. speak in this space. And I think now that we've seen the world kind of take the ball on that, we're like, wait a minute, mm -hmm. we shouldn't we shouldn't cancel people when they have right. something that we need to listen to. Mm -hmm. But but we perfected that. And so we I did. think what we have to do is is to take a step back and say, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Can I be your friend? Oh, that's so good. Can you explain to me how God led you into this space and, and, and in the places where we differ instead of saying, you know, we have a different theological position from one another, you're not welcome here. Right. And, and instead say, come and have coffee with me. I, mm -hmm. I'd love to know what the Lord is speaking to you. I love that. And I love you dearly. Mm -hmm. I mean, you and I have had our coffee yes, together. Yes, we have. And, uh, That's right. I just appreciate uh, the humility that you walk in, the truth that you walk in. And I just bless you and I pray for continual open doors for your message to go forth. And thanks for being here Thank today. you. It's my pleasure. What a we'll privilege. We'll do it again. We, I hope so. <laughs> okay. And friends, thank you for joining us. I know you were blessed. Come again next time. I'm Brenda Crouch. Thank you.